Howdy. I'm Greg Pilgrim. Well, one of my uh, subscribers at least <coughs> has told me that he likes my uh, tales of pipes as, oops, as well as my tales of guns. <laughs> well, here, let me get this up a little bit. There. How's that? That's good. Well, to please him, this is a Rossi, uh, what's it called, uh, Rubino Antico uh, 802, which is an Italian make, and it's a uh, smooth uh, pipe. It's not a, a rusticated. I prefer rusticated, but this is a really nice little pipe. It's not a church warden, so it's uh, not my preferred favorite, but it's a good one for around the house or put in your pocket and take it somewhere. Uh, I'm smoking a, a blend called uh, Early Morning Pipe, which uh, my tobacconist makes up. It's based on a Peterson blend that uh, costs a fortune, but his is a lot cheaper. And it just tastes almost exactly the same as the Peterson. Anyway, well, what I wanted to talk about was a little bit of American history. <coughs> we got into this little scrape with Spain. We called it the Spanish-American War. I don't know what they called it, but that was what we called it. And... Uh, in it, we kicked them out of Cuba and all of their other uh, foreign holdings and basically signed a, a, a treaty that says you're going to get the heck out of the Western Hemisphere and all of the Europeans stay the hell out away from here. We call it uh, the Monroe Doctrine. But uh, one of the things we picked up was the island of the Philippines. And the Filipinos were really ecstatic because, hey, these Americans just came along and liberated us from the Spaniards. Well, it wasn't exactly like that, because the Americans decided that they would basically continue a colonial presence there, only with Americans instead of Europeans in, in charge. Filipinos didn't particularly like that. Now, Filipinos were not exactly a united group. There were various tribes and uh, groups around the islands. Uh, it had been settled by Spaniards, uh, uh, the various uh, natives that were there, uh, Chinese, uh, some Indonesians had moved in, uh, a lot of other folks too. And uh, they all squabbled, but they all agreed on one thing, and that's they didn't want the Americans around. And one particular group, uh, the Filipinos, Philippines are a bunch of little islands. A couple of big ones, uh, Luzon is one of the bigger ones, and another big one is uh, Mindanao. So here's America trying to consolidate their gains in the Philippines, and they've got squadrons all over the place keeping an eye on things. And here's a bunch of doughboys over there in, uh, in Mindanao. <clears throat> well, the Mindanao was the home of the Moro. The Moro was a very warlike tribe. They, uh, Mindanao was their home, and they did not like the Americans one bit, not one bit. And they had a group of uh, fanatical warriors now, these Mindanao warriors, they would, they would fight with a, a blade very similar to, to a Wormfang here, a Chris. This is an Indonesian Chris, but it's very much like the ones that they used in the Philippines as well. And if you're with a, a platoon of, of uh, Americans and a bunch of guys with these come at you, it's not exactly the most entertaining day of your life. The problem is you could blast away at those guys and they'd still come. Because what they would do is a couple of things. They had shaman that would uh, bless them uh, and say, basically, you're going to go off to uh, Allah's paradise. They were quasi-Muslim, uh, but it was a sort of a, a endemic uh, a shamanic version of, of Islam. And uh, they uh, told them that they were going to go off to paradise if they uh, died in this uh, holy jihad. And then they would uh, give them this... Uh, basically a mix of, of uh, local botanicals, one of which was hashish, I know that, but I don't know what the rest of them were, some mushrooms and uh, uh, other things, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, atropine, scopolamine, or, or some other means that uh, uh, heightened their uh, warlike fervor, <coughs> uh, sort of like the uh, the berserkers of the, uh, the Viking world who, who drank a uh, mix of mushrooms that made them fearless. They called it the Berserker Ganger, where they would go into this trance-like state and, and just all they wanted to do was kill. Well, the Moro did the same thing. On top of that, 
they would wrap their bodies in linen tightly so that if you stabbed them or shot them or whatever, their guts would stay in long enough to go and wreak havoc before they died. Well, at the time, Americans were armed with the uh, Craig Jorgensen rifle up there in 30 caliber and a uh, 1892 Colt. Now, this was in 41 long Colt, but it'll do. The ones they had were in 38 long Colt, uh, similar sort of round. And they would just empty uh, the cylinders into one of these attacking Moro, and nothing happened, and they'd end up getting their heads cut off. Well, after a few such instances, the uh, army said, uh, hey, uh, ship back up those uh, uh, single-action army 45s. Now, this is in 3220, but it's going to have to do for this demonstration. And so here's the Americans now. They're using these, which are not exactly the most high-tech weapon around. This was issued in 1873. This in 1892. The difference is this is a single action. This is a double action. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so they were using these, but it gave the War Department a new challenge. Would you come and please uh, design a new gun <clears throat> that will... Uh, shoot a large enough bullet to stop a rampaging Moro and uh, drop him and his uh, Chris into the ground and, and uh, we stay alive. Well, about 1911, they came up with a plan. And <clears throat> again, this isn't exactly the right one. This is a Colt commander. But the 45 ACP, the 1911, that was the answer. And that's why throughout both world wars and up until recently, and even uh, to this day, uh, some special forces groups still use a 45. And, by the way, I love this little thing. And that's the, the tale of the progression of the American small arms. Uh, we got rid of the uh, Craig Jorgensen, went to the 1903 Springfield. Then we didn't have enough of those, so we then went to the 1917 uh, uh, Enfield. That was what we fought World War I with. <clears throat> and then... Uh, uh, about uh, the middle of the 1930s, we came up with the uh, M1 Garand, which was, again, 30-06, but was an eight-shot uh, semi-automatic, which Patton called the greatest war uh, machine ever developed. And he was right. To this day, it's still one of the best guns out there. But in terms of small arms, we stuck with the 45. And uh, we also had some machine guns in that 45 round. The M3 grease gun in particular was known as a really slow-firing uh, full-auto gun. You know, because it, 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 where a, a Schmeiser would be going, uh, an M3 would be going, bop, 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 bop. But the Schmeiser, for every two or three rounds, put about as much uh, uh, foot-pounds of energy into their target <clears throat> as one round of that M3 or the 45. You know, they, they pack a wallop. Uh, if you've ever shot into a, a, a pine board or or any target with a 45 and compared it to the uh, results from a 9mm, you'll see the difference. Yes, the 45 runs a little slower, but it runs it like a like a, a freight train, whereas the 9mm is like a sleek uh, uh, rocket ship, but is narrow and, and doesn't really do the, the trick as well. It's sort of a, an upgraded 38. A 38, it, it was okay for its time. Frankly, though, <coughs> I'm not sure that even a, even a 50, 60, or 75 caliber bullet would do much against a rampaging Moro. But uh, anyway, that's my, uh, my history lesson for the day, as it were. Yeah. Let me know if you're interested in this kind of stuff, and I'll do some more. Happy trails!